In this video, I'm going to review the Hilleberg Namage 2 tent. This tent is totally incredible. It's taken me to some of the wildest places on earth. I've spent over half a year of my life living in this tent. No, I'm not homeless, thank goodness. I'm blessed for that. But I've spent so many camping months in my tent that it's totally crazy. So that gives me some idea of what the great parts of this tent is and also the couple critical weaknesses that I will cover at the end of this video. Now the Namage 2 is from a company called Hilleberg. They're out of Sweden and you can order the tents from their website. I'll put a link below. Super nice. Now full disclosure, I am not sponsored by Hilleberg. Uh, they only know me because I've ordered tents from them, but I don't have some sort of financial or sponsorship relationship. I don't get these tents for free. They are crazy expensive. How expensive? This thing is north of 800 US dollars, so definitely not cheap. But in this video, what I'm going to do is tour you around the tent and give you some idea of all the different interesting features and some of the things that I don't like about the design. Now, a lot of people complain, oh, it doesn't have a lot of extra pouches and a lot of what we call goo -ga. I'm actually very happy for that because this tent is heavy. If you get the tent and the tent stakes, and the tent stakes, tent poles, and all those business, and you add this all up, you'd be packing the tent, I think, fully packed is six and a half pounds, about two and a half kilos. I mean, it, it's pretty substantial. But in order to survive some extreme conditions, you need an extreme tent, and it's going to be heavy. And I've heard that in an interview with Petra Hilleberg, and she said a lot of people complain about not having features, but if you add these extra features to the tent, those features make the tent so heavy that no one would buy it and then there's nothing to complain about. So I find this tent has a couple of the nice little niceties exactly enough for me and no more, which is really good. So one thing I want to show you straight away are the poles. These poles are beefcake. They are 10 millimeter poles. They are quite, uh, let's see if I can get the camera to focus there. Yeah, they're quite heavy duty and much better than the eight or nine millimeter poles. And there's a neat feature on the structure of the tent that allows two poles to be put into the sleeve. So if you're in 50 to 100 knot winds, you can actually double pull the tent for extra protection. That's a very nice feature. So what I'm gonna do is take you off the tripod here tour you around the tent and give you some idea of all the different little things and features and things I've noticed over spending nearly a half year of my life in this tent and using this tent for nearly a decade. Now you can see the size of the tent here based on my backpack. I've got my Arcteryx backpack there and I'll just simply walk you around the tent to give you a better idea of the overview of the design and everything else. As you can see, it's a little bit breezy today, which is good because it's a good simulation of the capabilities of this Hilleberg Namage 2. Now you can see the tunnel tent design, it only needs two hoops, which is really nice because if you're a soloist like me, where you don't often end up with tent partners, trying to put a dome tent up by yourself is a freaking disaster in weather. So there we go. Let me show you the contact points first of these hoops and the guy lines. You can see that they are almost a two inch strap or maybe five millimeters or really, or five millimeters, five centimeters. So they're really quite beefy. And you can see here that eventually they end up kind of pinching down. But as you can see, after nearly a decade of use and six months of ultra bad weather in Antarctica and Denali, they've actually held up incredibly well. Now, one interesting point about this design is if you see the pole pocket here, it looks wholly inadequate, right? So if you look at that thing, it's like, man, that can't really hold the poles, but you've got this strap here with a metal bracket, and this metal bracket is what allows you to tighten up the tent. Now it has a strap that connects here and also there's a little, oops, little loop that allows you to hook something else to it, including a footprint if you want it. So you can actually tension and stake this out if things are really crazy. 
Now you can see I just kind of finally starting to wear on this thing, but it's really not too bad. And remember that this sleeve can actually hold two poles. So if weather is really bad, that is not a problem. Now here we come to the front of the tent for the door entrance, the actual front upwind is over there. But for here, it's got this nice doorway here that you can, uh, well, doorway, it's more like a window, sorry, not doorway. And the nice thing is it's got zippers, so you can completely unzip this thing and get some good ventilation in the tent. Now, you can see the tie-ons here. I have never messed with this since day one. I've never adjusted these at all. And these knots are still holding well. There's a metal hoop in here that allows you to shape this, but it's highly flexible. I haven't broken this yet. It's been used, like I said, over six months of total use, over a decade. But if you come down here, what they did is an ingenious little loop system that allows this to tension and adjust, just like a climbing knot. And one of the interesting things is these tensioners are highly friendly for people wearing mittens because if you pull on the tensioner, let's say you have your thumb loose, you can pull on this tensioner and it tightens up. Now instead of fiddling and trying to unlock it, the trick is to simply put your hand through the loop, twist, and it pops and voila, it is so easy to do. So again, instead of trying to fight with this with your mittens at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius, you simply put your hand in there, pop it, and it twists. So it's a very brilliant design. Here I'll show you the up close. You pull, it releases, and that's all there is to it. At the end of the line is simply a bowling knot. You don't have to use anything crazy or anything like that. Very simple bowling knot works. These aren't the original stakes that came with it. The tent comes with plenty of stakes. But because I don't use this tent in the summer, I never have to worry about those stakes. Now up front here, you can see the same sort of buckling system that attaches. And also there is a loop for the footprint should you want it. And it has metal rings that attach to it, so you're always hooked on metal, which is really nice. You don't have to worry about cloth. But you can see here that they've got quite a loop of fabric to distribute the load. Now you see this big ugly repair, that's because yours truly got a cramp on into it and I slightly damaged it, so I went a little crazy. This is probably a total mess and an embarrassment, but that's okay. Now you'll see this strap here this strap is what gives the door structure. I'll open that later so I can show you inside. But that strap is what gives the tunnel tent and the door structure. So when you pop open this door, the strap tightens up and the tent just doesn't totally fall apart. And it takes the load off the door. Coming around here, this is one of the brilliant designs of the Hilleberg tent is they've used a forced pocket design where when you put the pole in on the other side of the tent and zip it through, it comes into the pocket and terminates. This pole pocket does support two poles, but this allows a soloist to easily put the poles in rather than doing the struggle with it maneuver. It pops out there, you got to run around. So silly. This is a far superior design. And you can see that on here too, where if it's totally crazy and you need to strap this down even more, you can. And it's got the same sort of structures with these straps that you can tension the lines. And you can see here, I'll just uh, tension this up a bit. And because the design of this line goes to the stake, and then back, it's self-balancing, so you don't have to worry about which line is tight. You just have to worry about, hey, get one of the lines tight, and it works well there, too. This is the other vestibule structure. It has the same sort of window 
opening into the tent and the same corners as well here. Now also, according to the Hilleberg instructions, you can actually stake the tent initially down with these stakes, and I've used these when the wind gets over 40 and 50 knots, which is 60 miles an hour or 100 kilometers per hour. You can actually stake these down before raising up the tent, and that is their suggestion. But again, all metal rings, all metal, nothing to fail here, which is really nice. I'm sure this will eventually tear, but this wind has seen 60 plus knot winds, and there you go. So it's uh, handling quite well. And it's got the same structure over here as well with these metal rings that take a lot of the load off if you need to really stake it down. And again, metal rings there. On this side of the tent, again, same sort of structure. You can come down here. You can see this loop. You can also see this line here. There's a line that actually runs under the tent. It's kind of hard to see, but that actually holds the structure, the internal tent, which I will show you in a moment. In a very simple to use pocket. So even if you're using mittens, it is so easy. And you can see that there's just a little bit of line and tension in here. And this is what this tent looks like after being to Antarctica and Denali and winter locations in the Rocky Mountains at 40 and 50 degrees below zero. So not too shabby. So now what I'm gonna do is put the camera back on the tripod, hop in the door and show you the interior design. Now I'm going to take you inside of the tent and give you some idea of the door structure, the zipper assembly, the fascinating design of how the actual interior of the tent of the double wall system and is actually held up. <laughs> held up. Now you can see this little toggle here that actually allows you to tighten up the door. And yes, I had the door rolled up when I stomped it with my crampons when I crum uh, was on some crumbling snow. It wasn't my best moment, that's for sure. But you can see the zipper here and they use good YKK zippers. It unzips all the way into the structure in here. Now do note that it actually has a double zipper system. So if you just need to vent up at the top, it is very nice. It's actually done quite well. All right, so you unzip it here and you simply roll the door up. You should probably roll it up on the inside, but this little toggle here is how you keep the door from flapping around, which is very good. Although, I have to say the toggles are hard to use with gloves. That is a challenge. And remember, I'll tell you the couple major downsides of this tent at the end of the video so you know what you're in for. Now, one of the bummers of a tunnel tent design is this strap that has to be here because in order to hold the structure of the tent up, you have to have rigidity in the strap. Let me tilt this down a bit. So you can see this strap right here. And that's a bummer because it is a trip hazard, but you know, it, just a fundamental structure. If you remove this, then the tension's all at the zipper and it'll ruin the zipper. So now what I'm gonna do is take the camera off the tripod and show you around the internal structure of the tent. Here we are in the inside of the tent. Say hello, GoPro. And as you can see here, the double wall tent design, which makes this such a good warm design, allows the actual internal structure of the shelter to actually float on the outside on these straps. Now, they are bungee type material and they've gotten a little loose over the years, but after 10 years, I've certainly gotten my use out of them. And they are simply held together by these toggles and these toggles are what hold the tent up. Now, even though you might think that looks like a disaster, I've been in crazy polar storms and it works just fine. You'll see this line across the front and that gives the whole tent structure. So you can completely remove this and just use the outer shell of the tent and actually still have a tent. So you don't even need this internal structure here. You'll see here, that there's lots of space for cooking in a vestibule. Yes, I've cooked in my tent. Yes, it's dangerous, I know. But it has a double 
door system so you can open this for ventilation and again unzip it completely so you can see outside and breathe and if you need to seal it up they've got these nice ykk zippers best i guess and you just simply zip it up there now up at the top here you'll see i've got a line and i use that line to dangle my ski when i had to repair it in antarctica that was pretty entertaining but you can see this structure here that's how the tent free floats inside the labeling is very reasonable they don't have this ridiculously huge label like other manufacturers here's the name nomage 2 and it's got a dual zipper system technically they say hey don't uh, use zipper pulls but i put one on there anyway and the zipper simply goes all the way up and around now of course i'm doing this one-handed so it's going to be a little bit awkward so you'll forgive me if it's not perfectly smooth and it zips all the way over there and then you take the front zipper or the bottom zipper sorry and uh, you simply zip it across and voila this door completely gets out of the way bundles in the side so you have a massive opening to get in and out of your tent with all of your kit which is super nice now as you can see here i've put my western mountaineering antelope bag in here it is a six foot six bag so that's a hundred and let's see six twelve uh like 195 centimeters long no problem it does end up going all the way to the end of the tent on both ends but it's totally reasonable the only fancy stuff it has are is a set of pockets here and here that's it so if you're one of those people that likes to ferret junk away in a dozen pockets in the tent forget it this is more of an explorer's tent where you don't plan to put a bunch of junk in the pockets plus it's not designed to take that kind of weight anyway I've never really taken off the label I don't know why but I've left it on there you can see the corners here are still quite intact after the extreme use I've put it through so it's uh, not too bad and you can see the sewing is still pretty darn good the zipper is still quite intact I've frozen the zipper shut more than once and I've got a video on how to get that off but you can see the internal zippers here you can actually zip this closed and once you untoggle it of course and this is the one of the annoyances is the toggle system even without gloves on is a little hard to use so you can completely zip this down and if you need ventilation just unzip it and voila you've got ventilation it's a little hot in here so i don't want to choke myself out but as you can see this is the bottom of the tent i did put a little bit of a damage in it and a tiny bit of tear i have no idea how to, i did it but it seems to do just fine you could put two people in here pretty easily without your gear but you could put your gear inside the vestibule so it's quite reasonable there as well on the other end here it has a nice door for ventilation and not only that it does have a screen so you can simply unzip here and it's got these little latchy toggle designs usually i just flip this over and it's no big deal but it does have this strap so if you need to uh, toggle this window open for some odd reason you don't like it flipping in your head it's kind of hard to do one-handed but uh let's see if i can succeed here nah probably not but you can see this design it does require two hands which eh, it's not that bad but i don't know what in the heck else you're going to do and it's very nice they give you this guy line that is tensionable so you can dangle your stinky socks or whatever else let me uh, put that back up here one moment i don't dangle a lot of stuff on there because it does pull on the tent structure but it's not that big a deal normally i just unzip this for ventilation and you can see again that i've got plenty of ventilation snow does come in through there of course in antarctica 
I was able to put my solar panels right here when I tightened everything up and charged through the tent so I could be doing charging at minus 40 and minus 50 degrees. That was a huge, huge benefit. As you can see here, I'm now sitting in my tent. If I fully sit up, I've got a fairly long torso. I'm 183 centimeters tall or six feet tall. And you can see my head just skims the surface. Now, I don't have the tent super tensioned out, but you can see, yeah, it does flop a little bit on your head, but eh, whatever, that's just the uh, way it works. If you fully tension the tent out, it does a little bit better. Now. As you can see here inside, this line, like I said, is very handy for hanging things. But if you had two people in the tent, I am fully at the back of the tent where I'm kind of jammed up. You could actually have another person in the other corner of the tent and you wouldn't even barely be able to touch each other's fingertips. So as you can see, there's actually a lot of space in this tent. Even though it's only really six feet, uh, it's about six and a half feet long or 195 or so centimeters, there's actually a lot of space in this tent. So if you just simply flip over, and I'll lay down here just to show you, uh, show you that I'm not fooling, that if you uh, decide to go this way, I still have I still have about 30 centimeters or one foot, or actually more, to the end of this tent. So there is lots of space because I'm putting my hands way the heck up here. It's actually really, really good. Now I'm going to close up the door and show you what it's like to be fully inside of the tent. And what I do is I always lift the uh, zipper a little bit. And you can see it's rippling. This is one of the downsides of a tunnel tent. I'll just uh, zip this all closed so you can get a good idea of what it's like to be in the breeze in the tent. It also has these nice strap locks here so you can tighten down the door if you just want to unzip the top. But it's also got this screen which I use all the time to get ventilation. I'll open it a lot. Now one disadvantage if you're a filmer like me, that red of the tent always colors your video and there's no way to get around it or really fix it too well. Um, some pro colorists might do a better job than I do. I don't do that great at that. But you can see this uh, ventilation here works totally, totally well. And yeah, it's, it's never a problem. In fact, you can totally zip this down. It's got these little strappy lock things here. Let me show you. This little strap here. So you can totally put the uh, screen down, lock it up, and it completely works. I, I've never used that literally ever, simply because when I'm at minus 20, minus 30 degrees, I don't really want to use that, but I'll normally, I'll normally keep the tent uh, ventilated to about here, uh, depending on the conditions, it's really not that bad. But you never want to fully seal this thing up, and I say never, because you need some ventilation. Otherwise, you're going to start steaming the interior of this thing from your breath and perspiration and steam from your body. And it'll get pretty moist in here because this is a very waterproof tent. So I've iced the uh, sides of this tent a lot, especially on Denali, no matter what I do, ventilation. Of course, it's like minus 20 and minus 30 Fahrenheit or minus, uh, what is that, 25 degrees Celsius. So I always keep the door open, but it's just kind of the nature how that works. So whether you want to fully unzip the door or just use the screen, it totally works. It's a really good design. But the thing about it is I really like is you can open this to ridiculous space and it's you know, that, that, that's four feet wide or maybe, I don't know, however many centimeters that is, but let's see, uh, four times 30 is 120 centimeters. It's really a huge gap that allows you to get, I mean, I've literally pulled my sleds or toboggans into this tent to load up when it's raging outside. So that's a great thing about this vestibule design is that even when it's crazy outside, 
I can pull my sled in here and the wind's whipping at 50 knots. I pull my sled in here, calmly load up, and I'm not standing outside freezing. So I get everything in my kit bag ready to go before I'm ever out. There is a GT design where you have another pole hoop to expand and have a bigger vestibule, but I never found a use for it. Uh, Vilberg uh, from Iceland, she did use the GT design, so she had a little bit better space, and which is nice for cooking. You do have to be careful. It would be relatively easy to damage this. I have cooked in this tent at, like for half a year. You do have to be careful because you can get carbon monoxide poisoning and all that. But really, this is totally usable. I mean, yeah, the, the tent might touch your head if you're a little bit tall, but and eh, whatever, you don't go out in the cold for discomfort. So what I'm gonna do now is pop out back side of the tent and tell you the, just as promised, the two major, no, one minor downside, as you can hear, and then the major downside of this tent design. Oh, it's not a design flaw, it's just a critical thing you have to know about the tents, and this is what you really need to stay tuned for. So let me get this unzipped here. Let me strap this guy here. Hopefully I'm not showing too much of my backside crack there. All right, and we'll hop out and I'll explain those little niggles. As you can see, the tent's totally sizable, completely usable. The bag is pretty sizable as well. It certainly won't fill up my backpack. I mean, you stuff this thing in there and it's, it only eats up about a third of the volume, but it's pretty good. So to the uh, promise, uh, I'll uh, roll up the tent at the end of the video, just so you can get an idea how big the bag is. But the, the first downside of the tunnel design tent is that when you've got 50, 60 knot winds, this huge surface starts to ripple. And it got so violent in Antarctica that the tent started compressing like a, a drum. And my ears started popping, it would go boom, pop, boom, pop. It was like, oh my gosh. So I unzipped the door to take the pressure off, but it can get really, really loud. Now, that's about any tent, unless you have a quad pole tent. Those are much quieter. A quad pole tent is definitely a good choice, but I am a soloist generally, so there's no way I'm gonna do a quad pole tent. It's just not gonna happen unless I'm doing some crazy mountaineering thing, and then I might just have to deal with it. But this, uh, this thundering, can be really deafening so if you know you're going to be in super windy conditions make sure to bring earplugs that is absolutely critical to sleeping in bad weather no matter what you're doing is you got to put those earplugs in because it's so loud you will never sleep and then you're going to have a rough time but the fundamental flaw of the tunnel tent design and you've waited the whole video for this is if you show up and the ground is frozen and you can't drive these stakes in, you're toast, you're screwed, you're hosed because you need to stake this tent down because it is not a freestanding tent. So what do I mean by that? If I took all these guidelines off, this tent just goes bloop, and I'll actually show that in the video as I pack this thing up in a time lapse. So if you, and this happened to me, Last November in Wyoming, there wasn't enough snow to use the snow stakes. Let me grab the snow stakes. There wasn't even nearly enough snow to grab the snow stakes, which are these, and you gotta buy these separately. They are crazy expensive, but if you do snow camping, there is no other choice. Here are the snow stakes. Yeah, very nice. They're about a foot long or 30 centimeters long. Then the old ones came with a plastic clip. The new ones actually come with a metal clip. It's slightly heavier, but over time, uh, this hasn't broken after you know, six months of hard use and crazy weather. But if you can't put these snow stakes down, which I discovered, and you show up and the ground is frozen and you cannot get stakes in, you can't put your tent up, and then trying to use your tent by placing it with rocks and everything, it, it just, it does not work well. So. That is the one fundamental flaw of the tunnel tent design overall, not Hilleberg's design failure. That's just the fundamental weakness of a tunnel tent is that if you can't get stakes in and you gotta put rocks and everything, it just won't be as good and you're going to have to use some crazy rocks. There was, I mean, there was only like two or three inches of snow. I couldn't dead man it. 
I couldn't drive stakes. I mean, I got my stakes in there and bang, 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 kink. Not good. So that is the fundamental flaw of this tent design is if the ground's frozen and there's not enough snow, you're in real trouble. So it's a big consideration. If the ground's rocky, you can kind of get away with it. But if the ground's frozen, you can't come up with the rocks, you're toast. So what I'm going to do now is actually roll the tent up. I'll do a time lapse and then show you what this guy looks like in, uh, in the bag and give you an idea. But definitely, if you're going to an extreme location, buy an extra set of poles because if you do break a pole, and these poles have taken a heck of a lot of beating, if you do break a pole, it does come with a repair kit. Uh, uh, let's see, I guess I should take this out to show you because otherwise I'd be a bad reviewer if I didn't. I've done some bad reviews and I apologize. Yeah, it comes with a spare pole and if I can get it out, I've never actually needed it, a coupling that comes with this kit so you actually can couple over a broken or kinked pole and totally get away with it. This is super nice. So that comes with it. You don't have to buy it separate. You pay a lot of money for this tent. And um, that's a key feature too. Forgot about that. I'm trying to remember what other uh, critical things are in there. I'm trying to get this back in as a struggle so I want to waste video time on that. But remember, if you're going to an extreme location, get an extra set of poles. These still slide in so nicely. They're the best poles I've ever used. And you can literally put dual poles in this tent, so if it's extremely raging, but at least bring one extra pole uh, if you're going for a long expedition in some crazy remote place where your life depends on your tent. Because once you break a pole and you're trying to use a locker with the tape, eh, it's okay, but nothing like having a backup pole until you can get yourself sorted again. Let me switch the time lapse. I'll roll the tent up and show you how big it is. So as you can see, it's pretty reasonable to take this tent down. This is about how small it packs. Well, not about how this is exactly how small it packs. But if you notice in the time lapse, I was able to take both poles, those two poles out simultaneously without them unlocking. Getting two poles out simultaneously out of a dome tent, uh, that falls in the forget about it. My expedition partner, Terry Williams, a doctor, when we go out, uh, he's... <laughs> Even though he's got a lot of experience, he doesn't have as much experience in with these tents. And while he's taking individual poles out of our uh, Karen 3 GT with four poles, I'm able to bzzz, get those poles out in seconds while he's still pushing them through. So that ability to remove both poles simultaneously, get them out, and get it done is really helpful in extreme weather conditions. So what I'm going to do is, right now is just to flip the angle of the camera and show you how big the tent is versus a standard backpacking backpack. All right, I've got my Arcteryx backpack here. Yes, uh, the uh, Ultra, which they don't sell anymore, is ridiculously expensive, just like this eight plus hundred dollar tent. Ridiculously expensive, for its, but it, for extreme conditions, you need extreme equipment. So you can see here, let me pull it back just a bit, so you can see how big this tent is. If I jam this tent in there, there is still lots and lots of space. So I could actually just simply unclip this here and run the straps through the tent because you don't want to just carry the tent. Guaranteed it will slide out, but they are very nice in Hilleberg. Even thought about putting the extra strap loops here so it's easier to strap your tent to your backpack, and even though it slides around a little bit, it is totally manageable. So I'll do that here, and uh, do this here. Okay, and now because of the Hilleberg design, even on the bag, they've thought of everything. This tent really isn't that big on a backpack. I'll stand up, put the uh, bag on, and just show you what it's like on me. 
Now I'm going to show you what it's like to have this on your backpack. Now granted, I don't have any other kit in my backpack, but it is totally reasonable. Yes, it does throw my weight out a bit, but instead of eating space in my backpack, if I'm fully loaded going up to Nolly, I don't have room for my tent. But as you can see here, it's a very reasonable size tent for extreme conditions. Totally survivable in Antarctica, on Denali, Elbrus, uh, the Arctic, whatever uh, HE double hockey sticks scape you want to go to. But boy, it's a really, really good tent. So this uh, Hilleberg Namage 2, it is a black label. That means they're extreme condition tent. And I've seen other people use the Solo and others, but boy, this, <laughs> this Hilleberg really does it for me. Again, full disclosure, I am not sponsored by Hilleberg. They don't give me money for this. I receive no compensation for these videos and I'm not making that up. And unlike other reviewers, I've used this tent for months and months and months and fractions of a year, dedicating my life to actually being in this tent and being in the craziest conditions. Hopefully I'll put a couple clips in here to show you what it's like. Woohoo! It's been like that all day. My name is Aaron Linsdow. I'm a polar explorer, oddly enough. Check out links below to my books, Antarctic Tears, Adventure Expedition 1, How Do You Keep Your Feet in the Cold, Jackson Hole Hiking Guide, oh. Total Equip Eclipse Guides for 2024, and also my show World Beyond on Amazon so you can see my travels and experience them with me. And also, if you want to see what Antarctica is really like when you're alone, check out Antarctic Tears, the Expedition movie on the link below in the description. Thank you very much for watching and enjoy your adventures in your tent.